name is Kimberly Dye. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at McMaster University, and I'm also associate director of the Life Sciences program. And I guess I teach second year cell biology and genetics, um, as well as life sciences courses on health and disease. So, what makes a good paper? So you have to have a, a good question. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's made from observations, so perhaps there was a very simple observation that there was a, uh, a, a correlation, maybe a weak correlation, but a correlation between the onset of symptoms for autism and having a vaccination. And so, interesting question, but then you have to frame it in a scientific way, and you have to frame a hypothesis that's testable. Uh, and I think what was lacking in, in the Wakefield study was um, a large data set, and I think what was also lacking was um, there wasn't a, a very good control population that was looked at. So he looked at this correlation between in individuals that were affected, but he didn't look across a very large population and say, well, here are many people that received vaccinations and weren't affected by autism. So I think if you look at the whole population, you come up with a very different answer. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think one of the most important things in any publication, in any research, is how many controls you do. You can never do too many controls. Um, so then what was lacking also was the peer review process kind of fell apart as well. And sometimes that happens uh, when it's a very hot topic and people want to publish anything on it. And so sometimes people aren't as careful as they should be. And I think sometimes it also happens when the author, the primary researcher, is a very big name in the field. And so people have this bias towards believing people that have been accurate or been, uh, been honest in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you guys, you took the 2A or 3 course. Yes, right? I did. Yes. Okay, so we spent a whole tutorial looking at some examples of very similar yeah. cases in stem cell research. And I think in every one of those cases of stem cell research that was published when it was either false or inaccurate or uh, modified mm -hmm. and intentionally was, in, was you know, designed to mislead the reader. In all of those cases, it was a very hot topic. People are trying to publish in this field. There's a lot of money involved. And again, in most cases, we're looking at head researchers, the primary investigator, who was very well known in the field. And sometimes it was people working in their lab that that were actually perpetuating the, the impropriety. And so the reviewers tending to trust the big name perhaps didn't review it as carefully as they should have. So I think it happens in a lot of fields, but again, mostly these fields where there's a lot of money and a reputation. So I, you could ask some questions about why it took so long. There were many people that almost immediately after the publication questioned it mm -hmm. and did not think that it was very good science and thought that there wasn't enough proof but yet it took five or six years to actually retract it. Mm -hmm. I think that's, again, it's going to have a lot to do with reputation and money funding. Um, the other issue with autism is that you're dealing with not just the science in the lab, but you're also dealing with real people. And so these are parents that have children that are affected, and they're very emotionally tied to the answer. And with something like autism, where even now we don't, know what the cause is. We have certainly more and more information about this combination of genetics and environment, but we don't know what the cause is, that that parents sometimes cling to an answer. So if they have someone or something they can blame, it helps them to deal with the situation. So then you have this cohort of parents that were very supportive of Wakefield and his publication because it gave them an, uh, an answer instead of just I have no idea what happened to your child. Mm -hmm. So when it has that, the support of this group of, of people and parents, then it sometimes it's harder to, to see the science independent of the people. Mm -hmm. So when the, when the paper was actually released, I think in 1998, mm -hmm. do, you, do you remember it being published? And I mean, did you actually look at it yourself? Or? Uh, I didn't. So 1998, when was I in I must have been in Baltimore still, so I was a graduate student. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't see it when it first came out. Mm -hmm. um, I had followed it before the retractions, maybe in the early two thousands. Okay. 
paper, I had followed the paper, uh, mostly because I had been interested in autism for a long time. When I was your age, I worked with autistic kids and okay. as a volunteer, and uh, it's always been very interesting to me. I read sort of more of the popular articles and popular literature on autism, but um, yeah, it always seemed suspect mm -hmm. to me. Uh, there yeah. is no evidence to show yeah. that there's any link between vaccines and autism. There is no reliable, reproducible evidence to show that link. Mm -hmm. So without the evidence, I can't, I can't possibly believe that. Mm -hmm. And and even like the media, they they hyped it up. With, you know, you saw it with like people like Jenny McCarthy and yeah. Jim Carrey. Absolutely. And uh, how do you think that the media played a role in? I guess like publicizing and maybe giving some false information here and yeah. there. Well, I think it is a shame. So even after the retraction, Jenny McCarthy and other uh, stars, <laughs> media, um, still say that no, there is actually a link. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that without any evidence yeah. at all. And I think that's unfortunate because they do carry a lot of sway for people even though they don't have a scientific background, a lot of the general public still believe what they say. So I think it's unfortunate when, when famous people can say something without any evidence whatsoever and people believe them, and yet there can be, since the Wakefield publication, since the retraction, there has been much evidence, many publications that have shown the opposite, that have shown that there is no link between these two things, and yet they've been pretty much ignored. So I think that's a really unfortunate thing in and of itself, even more unfortunate when it causes people not to vaccinate their children, which is an incredibly dangerous thing to do. You also took 3AO3 and we talked about herd immunity. If you are not reaching that herd immunity threshold, you're endangering people's lives. So maybe your child is fine, but your child can pass on measles, rubella, whooping cough to another child, and then that other child could die. And so it's a huge responsibility that these parents are undertaking, not just for their own family, but for their entire community. And I think it's really unfortunate when they're, I think it's entirely fair if they make that decision for their own children, but really unfortunate when they're making the decision for the wrong reasons mm -hmm. and based upon erroneous information. Well, I think it kind of comes, so we have scientists that talk about this. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that there is still this, this gap between scientists and communicating to the public. And it's something that I'm really interested in, and I kind of encourage students that are interested in science and talking about science and reading about science to get into this field of scientific journalism. It's actually a very, very small field. There are very few people that do this and do this well, being able to communicate scientific information to the public. It's a difficult thing to do, and you go into it knowing the scientific background, and you can explain this in your head, and you can explain it to your peers, but now explain it to someone in the general public that's never taken high school biology. And I think that's a very difficult task to have, and it's not, and I'm not being demeaning or insulting, it's just they don't, a lot of people don't have that basic fundamental knowledge to understand some of these mechanisms and processes that you're talking about. So I think that's something that's lacking in our society, is that ability to communicate scientific information well to the public. So I don't necessarily blame the scientists, because that's not what they were trained to do. Mm -hmm. But I think there is missing in our society this group of people that can make that link between the research and the public. It has to be a combination. So the other thing we talked about in genetics was these multifactorial um, uh, diseases where it's a combination of environment and genetics and the interaction of those two things. So there's this field of quantitative genetics that's really um, looking for the, these multiple different factors. So you might remember when we talked about these quantitative trait loci where you're looking at a disease or a disorder and you're looking for the 30 genes that might be involved in affecting the individual's symptoms or phenotype. Um, there are some really neat studies, some of which are here at McMaster, that are looking for some of the genetic factors that are involved. And the idea is to do these genome-wide association studies where you are going into it completely unbiased, which is what 
was missing in the Wakefield study. So going into a completely unbiased and simply saying, are there any genes that are differentially expressed in individuals that are affected or unaffected? And then you can potentially come up with a group of genes. So yeah, I think that those studies are and will continue to come up with candidate genes that might be contributing, but it's still going to be an interaction of those genes and those alleles with the environment as well. And I think interesting is this idea of, of epigenetics, where it's kind of a little bit of both, right? It's not changes in the alleles, but the environment can affect the expression of genes. And so epigenetics can be affected by the prenatal environment, by the postnatal environment, and those could all have an effect on whether or not a, a child that might be susceptible to the symptoms of autism actually show those symptoms. And I think that also is apparent when we realize that autism isn't a single disease, that it really is this spectrum disorder where there are some children that have very mild symptoms, something like Asperger's, and other children that are almost incapacitated by the, the enormity of the symptoms that they're affected by and they can't function in society. So I think that that differential expressivity is an indication, again, that multiple factors are contributing to it. I think that all diseases, even if we look at something like diabetes, mm -hmm. we think of that as pretty simple. We know that it's a, this oh, defect in the production of insulin. But there are examples of individuals in which it's an autoimmune disorder. There are other individuals that have inherited alleles that affect the production of the uh, pancreatic cells and the production, the ability of their, those cells to produce insulin. There are environmental effects, such as lifestyle. Um, obesity has an effect on diabetes. There are many different things that affect diabetes, and we feel like diabetes is something we understand pretty well. So I think that that will be true of autism. We'll come up with this collection of factors and we can make predictions about whether or not a child will be affected, but maybe we'll not ever be able to make that 100% prediction.